right. And welcome back to part two of the Virtual Graphic Novel Club's DC's Doom Patrol. And this is Erica. I'm Roland. And we're going to get into some of our extra characters that were added on later. Some other members of Doom Patrol, these were added in the 80s, I believe. Yeah. So uh, first up, we have Dorothy Spinner, whose first appearance was Doom Patrol Volume 2, number 14 in November of 88, and the appearance of Death in Doom Patrol Volume 3, number 22 in September 2003. Now, Dorothy Spinner was a member of the Doom Patrol with the ability to draw imaginary beings from her mind into the real world. She was adopted as a child, but faced bullying due to her facial deformity. She created imaginary friends instead of keeping it, uh, instead to keep her company, which was all which these friends were also able to teach her how to read and write. Over time, Dorothy realized that her friends were no longer imaginary and had come to life. Eventually, some imaginary friends started to scare Dorothy with grisly fairy tales, so she shot them with an imaginary gun. When her parents realized they could no longer keep their daughter safe from her psychic powers, they called Niles Calder of the Doom Patrol, who took Dorothy to the patrol's new mountainside base. There, Dorothy would largely be looked after by Josh Clay rather than by Calder himself. Shortly after arriving, her powers would go haywire due to the interference of a reality-altering device called the... Okay, y'all stick with me right now. The material... The materiopticum. All right, yeah, Materiopticon, got it, which had been stored in the Doom Patrol's base. This resulted in Dorothy's imaginary friend returning from the dead, which terrified her. Still, with the help, she could make peace with her imaginary friends when she realized they were trying to help her overcome her anxieties about starting puberty. After that incident, Dorothy matured slightly and became more comfortable in her skin, although she remained timid and easily scared. Now, um... That's the comic book version of her on TV. The version of her is basically that Niles Calder, um, his love interest is, I want to say hundreds of years old. I would not say that she was a Wendigo or anything like that, but she was a mystical being, some probably closer to a shaman. Mm -hmm. And Dorothy Spinner is actually their love child. Mm -hmm. And because and because she ages so slow in the series, she looks to be about 11 or 12 years old, mm -hmm. but she's actually a grown woman. She's mm -hmm. probably about 150 some odd years old. Right. Remember Niles Calder had been working on the longevity formula. So this is, this is his child from way before the Doom Patrol was actually a thing, okay. all right? Um, now, she has, in the TV show, she has the same powers where she, um, all of her creations come to life. Mm -hmm. The main character that they utilize, though, is the candle maker. Mm -hmm. And the candle maker is basically an entity that wants to basically overtake her. She still controls the candle maker, but I think it's basically based on her, on, it feeds on her fears. Mm -hmm. All right. And this thing, can it, it wiped out the Doom Patrol once, but she was able to <laughs> get them back. Same. Right. So uh, that's Dorothy Spinner. Now, she also had to move to the moon, so she wouldn't cause no other problems. <laughs> All right. So uh, next up is Reeves. Uh, first appearance, Doom Patrol, Volume 2, Number 19, February of 89. After the invasion of the Dominators that wiped out most of the current Doom Patrol, Larry Trainer, the superhero formerly known as Negative Man, now spending time recovering in the hospital, was found by the negative spirit Mercurius, whom he had separated from. Now, I'm going to come out of this for a second. He has, there are two negative spirits that he actually had combined with. Mm -hmm. The first one, I can't remember his name, um, but he's in the comics as well, but this is the one that he is bound to now mm -hmm. in the TV show. Uh, this was the first negative spirit that he bound with, but they ended up going on a journey in the outer space, and he began to learn more about yeah, the negative he, spirit. Right. Was it like uh, when we covered 
when we were talking about him, it was like a, I think when I was doing the research, it's a more spirit bound. Like the first right. one was spirit also, but this one is cosmic. Right, cosmic right, right. Movie. Well, both, both of them were cosmic. This one, this one is a, the, the one that he's bound to in the comic first, what they're showing in the TV show is that he basically, after he went through his genesis, he broke away and gave, basically gave him a baby, a baby negative spirit to mm -hmm. raise so that they would be more in tune. Yeah. Uh, Mercurius basically um, just wanted to merge with him again while he was in the hospital. But this time it realized when it noticed his female doctor, mm -hmm. it wanted to um, basically merge, made contact with both of them mm -hmm. at the same time. And so when he did this, he basically fused the life forms into one single entity. And this was the powerful intersex being known as Rebus. Now, the hospital applied medicated bandages to Rebus' body to contain the radioactive energy, and they contacted Dr. Niles Calder. Um, when Rebus reunited with the remainder of Larry's former teammates from the Doom Patrol, it was when the uh, scissor men began to attack their reality. By absorbing some of their memories, Rebus led the team to the Scissormen's base of operations. He also located the leaders of the Scissormen and by philosophically confusing them, caused them to explode and return reality to normal. Now, uh, Rebus briefly reconnected with Eleanor Poole's former husband, Dan, to explain the situation that they now found themselves in. Dan was devastated that his wife had been absorbed into a new being and reacted emotionally, but Rebus offered a simple hug goodbye as closure. Rebus was given a bedroom to rest in when he joined the Doom Patrol headquarters. However, it chose not to furnish it at all. And according to Cliff, it spent all her free time unpacking a Russian nesting doll and talking to itself in the dark. With disaster, oh, you know what? Now, basically, um, during it was a um, an incursion mm -hmm. with the uh, with the dominators. After after that ended, Danny the Street had basically accumulated enough energy to manifest as something new, which was Danny the World. Right, right. another uh, planet, mm -hmm. and we'll get to um, Mr. Danny, Mr. Danny in a minute. <laughs> but an entire planet and another dimension for for the people to live on. And Rebus decided, due to her naturally peculiarity that it was better for them to live on Danny full time. And that's when it said goodbye to Cliff and the rest of the Doom Patrol. And basically it's because Danny is a member of the Doom mm -hmm. Patrol. It's, he's still, he's still in the right. big, he, he, he doesn't live in the natural world yeah. where, where everybody so. else is. Right. That's good. Now on the TV show, Dorothy ends up living Oh, on Danny as well, mm -hmm. just because um, because of her machinations when she started. She, they mentioned that briefly uh, when I was researching Danny that she mm -hmm. also lived there for a right. brief period of time and to Crazy Jane and right. Rita said so. Yeah. And speaking of Crazy Jane, Miss Kay Chalice. Yep. Her first appearance was in Duke Patrol Volume 2, number 19 in February 1989. Um, when Kay was a young girl, she was molested by her father. Okay, I, I should say before this, trigger warning for Kay yeah. Crazy Jane. If you do yeah, not want to hear some horrific things, uh, just go ahead and skip this part. Yes, Crazy Jane has, Crazy a, dark Jane has a dark past. Uh, so, uh, the first time he molested her, she was playing with a jigsaw puzzle, and this is important to her. Well, I guess this is a piece to her life for um, these jigsaw puzzles and puzzle pieces in general. Uh, uh, due to this abuse, Jane needs to needs an entirely different personality uh, named Miranda. Miranda. Uh, she creates an entirely different personality named Miranda. On Easter Sunday, Miranda is the victim of attempted rape in a church and it triggers flashbacks to her former abuse and the destruction of Miranda's personality and the completion of a massive personality fragmentation. Kay is committed to a mental institution soon after. When the Dominator's gene bomb went off during the invasion, Jane and all of her personalities were affected. 
Each of the characters gained a different power, AKA, for example, Black An Anis has a retractable claw, split, can teleport, et cetera, et cetera. Crush Steel was staying in the institution, the same institution where Jane uh, was when Will Magnus asked Cliff to look after her, which led Jane to become a member of Doom Patrol. Eventually, Jane made pilgrimage back to her childhood home, facing her traumas and overcoming them. This brought her peace to her inner turmoil, and for the first time in her life, she finally felt like she could live a happy, productive life with her condition. After this incident, Jane believed that none of her alters had retained their superpowers. Upon returning to the Doom Patrol, Jane was attacked by the candle baker and thrown into another dimension similar to the real world. She was interned as a schizophrenic and treated with shock therapy. Cliff eventually rescued Jane from her other dimension and lived with her in Danny World. In Danny the World. It was later revealed that Jane's alters still possessed their powers despite Jane believing them otherwise. And as a result, Cliff left her and returned to Earth. The two separated due to constant arguments, mostly Cliff's fault, and that's because Cliff feared her. Jane stayed with Danny the Street, and after the interdimensional beings gentrified his street, hilarious, uh, <laughs> she and Jane sought refuge in a brick. Well, they sought refuge with uh, Doom Patrol, which now resided on o Long Island. Yeah, it was all Island. And still, they were followed by the gentrifiers, who saw the brick as their rightful property. <laughs> Danny assumed a new form as Danny the Bungalow, and the brick was returned to the gentrifiers who prompted, promptly departed. Jane remained on Olong Island and with Danny the Bungalow. And that is Jane, Crazy Jane. All right. <laughs> now, up next, we have Danny the Street, whose first appearance, Doom Patrol, Volume 2, Number 35, August of 1990. Now, Danny is a sentient street who can place himself anywhere around the world. Danny lets the people tossed out by society have a place to rest. He entertains them with drag shows and various shops. Danny cross-dresses and enjoys experiencing, expressing himself by putting pink frilly awnings or curtains on gun stores and the like. Danny was targeted by the mysterious governmental organization called the Men From Nowhere for being too abnormal. He was rescued by the Doom Patrol who decided to move into Danny shortly after the attack and used him as their headquarters. Mr. Nobody and the Brotherhood of Dada later kidnapped him. They wanted him to take them somewhere else, and he happily complied. Danny thought the Brotherhood of Dada was perfectly fine. Danny would be significantly damaged when Dorothy Spinner of the Doom Patrol accidentally unleashed the monstrous candle maker. Still, Danny endured the attack and grew into Danny the world. Some members of the Doom Patrol, like Crazy Jane and Rebus, chose to continue living in Danny the world, but the members Dorothy and Robot Man opt to move out and live in the real world. Danny was deconstructed by the gent gentrifiers and was left as only Danny the Brick, with Crazy Jane protect protecting this brick. Danny the Street and Crazy Jane had recently rejoined the Doom Patrol recently. <laughs> and there she is now a bundle. Yeah, and so... The him being damaged by the candle maker, that's season two. Mm. Um, so all all of these characters kind of play in. Uh next up. <clears throat> Let's get into some of our Dang. favorite. Yeah. All right. And if you thought it was weird now, let's get to the even weirder. We oh gosh. <laughs> okay. I would get this one. <laughs> we get um Ultimax, or AKA the Brain, uh, and the Brotherhood of the Evil. I'm going to cover each one of them separately, but they both are. Uh, yes. Anyway, the Brain was once a brilliant silent scientist who was disfigured and left with only a brain in a metal box. When he died, his assistant put his brain in a liquid filled container. It was thought that Dr. Niles Calder caused the accident, hmm. and the Brain vowed his revenge on Calder. While he can communicate and mastermind brilliant criminal exploits, there is little else he can do. He's only he is most frequently seen with his companion and lover, Monsieur Ma, Ma uh, a super intelligent gorilla with a machine gun. Note the brain was take had taken the superior ape and through secret teaching methods and shock their treatments, gave the ape an IQ of 178, which is genius status. 
Uh, the brain became the head of the Brotherhood of Evil, whose secret headquarters was in the exclusive girls' school in Paris. Under his leadership, the Brotherhood became the most powerful crime syndicate in the world. The brain has battled the Teen Titans and even teamed up with Dr. Thaddeus Savannah, who we know for uh, Black Adam, and, Black Shazam. Adam and Shazam, hoping that the mad industrialist might figure out something that Ma Ma Mariah Mama. Mama? Yeah. and the brain, I know I just said it, but <laughs> it, it didn't have uh, Monsieur in front of it. <laughs> oh gosh! Um, and, and the brain did not realize. While on, on <clears throat> while on the prison planet, the brain and Monsieur Mala arrive at Joker's camp, and Mala asks Gorilla Groid to speak with him away from the others. Mala told Groid that he won't. Grod, sorry, Grod that they should take over the base due to their superior intelligence compared to the men. Grod laughed and reminded. Mala, that he only got his powers from humans and was not born a proud child of Gorilla City. This enraged Mala and he attacked Grodd. Brain intervened and Grodd picked up Brain, beating Mala to death with the metal box. The damage to the brain god caused him to die in the arms of the one he loved. Oh. And that is the brain. And then, of course, there's Brotherhood of Evil, who uh, was made famous by the brain himself, and their first appearance was in Doom Patrol. Number 86 in March 1964, uh, they are the most potent terrorist organization in the world, led by, of course, the brain. And many superheroes have thwarted their operations, but mostly the Doom, prominently the Doom Patrol and the Teen Titans are who they go up against. Yeah, and see, the, the Brotherhood of Evil is shown in season, I think at the end of season one and beginning of season two, because mm -hmm. they are... Um, they basically hire some people to go after Niles Calder. Yeah, yeah, we'll get through. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's that's a picture of him from the TV show right there with the red eyes. His monster. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Next up, we have Mr. Nobody. I'll take the next two because <laughs> okay. uh, they're tightly interwoven. Um, Mr. Nobody, Eric Morton, first appearance, Doom Patrol, eighty six, March of sixty four. Uh, Aaron Morton was a one-man crime wave, a master criminal who once stole one of the chief's lunar exploration droids named Rog to impress the brain in hopes of joining the Brotherhood of Evil. However, he, the brain, and Monsieur Mala had a fallout of some sort, and Morton preferred to flee rather than face the wrath of the brain. Both villains threatened to kill Morton if he returned, so he hid for years in Paraguay. While in Paraguay, he contacts a Nazi scientist to share his findings. Uh, Morton was already somewhat unstable, and the Nazi exposed him to a device called the White Room, which drove him irredeemably insane and converted his body into a mass of living virtuality that could drain the sanity of other humans. Calling himself the man of the 21st century, the first true virtual man, he rechristened himself Mr. Nobody and organized the rebirth of a brotherhood that shared his ideals. Because of this, he chose not to restart the Brotherhood of Evil and instead initiated the Brotherhood of Dada, a group of lunatics that followed Morden's ideas to change the world. His first plan was to steal a magical painting and feed the city of Paris to it. He succeeded and the entire city was thrown into an alternate universe. Fortunately, the Doom Patrol managed to recover and restore it. However, many members of Nobody's Brotherhood chose to remain in the painting. Mr. Nobody escaped and enacted a second plan to change the world. He stole Albert Hoffman's bicycle. He used its psychedelic resonance to power his presidential campaign in the United States. The U.S. government, unwilling to see a madman like Nobody, steps up to the president, step up to the president, step up to the presidency, sent a similarly insane agent named John Dandy to stop him. Once gaining the support of the people, Nobody attempted to merge the reality within the painting that ate Paris with the real world, but was interrupted by John Dandy, who used one of the faces floating around him to force Nobody into transforming back into Eric Morton. As a human, he became vulnerable, and Dandy skewered him with a broken piece of wood. Though he survived long enough to attempt to escape into the painting, the painting was destroyed and Morden faded into nothingness. 
Now, um, he was the big bad of season one. Mm -hmm. They knew not what was going on. And if you see the little picture down there I put in there, that was a freaky um, criminal to watch on, t on the TV screen. It was absolutely weird. It kind of set the stage for the weirdness of the Doom Patrol TV mm -hmm. series. So weird. All right. Okay, so next up we have the Brotherhood of Dada. First appearance, Doom Patrol, Volume 2, number 26, September of 89. The Brotherhood of Dada was an absurdist team created by Mr. Nobody after he was denied membership of the Brotherhood of Evil. He double-crossed the Brotherhood of Evil and was forced to flee after they found out. He created this new Brotherhood, one not dedicated to evil, which Mr. Nobody considers an outmoded concept, but to celebrate life's absurdity. And he called this anarchistic group the Brotherhood of Dada. In the TV show, this is the Sisterhood of Dada. It has male and female members still, but it is run by Madame Rouge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now you can jump into Madame Rouge. All right. And next on our list is Madame Rouge, who is Laura the Mill. Her first appearance was in Doom Patrol number 86 in March 1964. And her death is was in New Teen Titans number 15 in January of 1982. So she is no longer with them. But Laura DeMille was originally a French stage actress. After an automobile accident, she developed a dual good evil split personality. At this point, she attracted the notice of the brain and his associates, Monsieur Mala. And with Mala's help, the brain performed surgery on DeMille. That was, from his perspective, successful, and it subdued the her 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 good personality and allowing her evil personality to remain dominant. Thus, Madame Rouge was born. She was the only female member of the Brotherhood of Evil and assisted the Brotherhood in continuing conflicts against the Doom Patrol. At first, Madame Rouge was simply a master of disguise. Uh, the subsequent surgery by the brain eventually gave her the ability to alter her appearance and stretch her limbs. Later, Rouge, Rouge's split personality manifested again with her good personality occasionally appearing. Rouge was a romantically linked to Doom Patrol leader Niles Calder and was able to help, he was able to help Rouge overcome her evil side and ally with the Doom Patrol. Rouge's mind reverted back to its evil state though, causing her to seek vengeance against the Brotherhood of Evil and the Doom Patrol for their previous interference. She was successful in murdering both groups Years later, Robot Man and the Teen Titans tracked Rouge down and her ally, General Zal, and Beast Boy then changed and killed Rogue. Though at the moment of her death, her good side manifest, and she forgave Changeling and called to Niles, her parent, true love. It is to note that Madame Rouge has a daughter named Gemini, who's also a shapeshifter, who appears later to seek revenge against Beast Boy and the Teen Titans. Yep. All right, next up, the big bad for season three, the current season of Doom Patrol on TV. General Immortus, whose first appearance was My Greatest Adventure, number 80, June of 63. Basically, their original villain. Mm -hmm. All right, General Immortus has an unknown origin, and his exact age is unknown. He made his wealth in the diamond mine business. He ended up killing many of the workers to keep the location a secret. After that, most of General Immortus's schemes were to sustain his longevity, and like this, he became the leader of a criminal syndicate to steal ancient mystical artifacts for this purpose. He lives indefinitely due to a life-extending alchemical potion, although he lost the formula. As his potion began to run out, he hired young scientist Niles Calder to recreate the potion. When Calder discovered Immortus's identity and plan, he sabotaged the life by extending rate that he had been developing. As the chief, Calder later formed the Doom Patrol specifically to combat one of Immortus's later schemes. Now, Immortus spared the Doom Patrol, usually to obtain the results of the chief's life extension research. Well, no, he didn't spare them, he sparred with them. Uh, Immortus was a one-time member of the Brotherhood of Evil and and it makes sense because this was a group formed largely to combat the Doom Patrol. A second Doom Patrol was initiated by an Indian woman named Arani, claiming to be Miss Niles Calder and calling herself Celsius. The general submitted her to a mind scan to find the secret to immortality, 
and managed to become young for the briefest moment on his moon base until the Doom Patrol got free and started to destroy the base as he began regressing to his former age. The immortality treatment failed because it had been prepared specifically for Arani's physiology. <laughs> That's what he gets. Ah, <laughs> oh, Gargax. Yep, Gargax. Gargax. Oh. He was on the show too? Okay. Yep. <laughs> His first appearance was in Doom Patrol number 91 in 1964. And he died in Doom Patrol volume 2, number 18, in February 1989. Garbawax came to Earth to test his weapon. He was set to be banished from his home world and intended to use his weapons to conquer Earth. After his first defeat by Boot Doom to Patrol, Garbawax joined the Brotherhood of Evil and repeatedly fought against Doom Patrol. Garbawax claims were later proven false. It was revealed that he's an agent of Zax 13, the ruler of a Garbawax planet. He betrayed the Brotherhood of Evil after Zarex 13 arrived to Earth to conquer the planet. This led the Doom Patrol and the Brotherhood to briefly work together to defeat Zarex 13 and foil Gargoyle's plan to destroy Earth. During the Alliance invasion, Gargoyle attempted to join the Alliance only to be rejected and have to have his base on the moon co-opted by the Alliance. Feeling slighted, Gargoyle three <laughs> reluctantly joined forces with the Doom Patrol in defeating, defending Earth. Not defeating, defending, but only so he could later take the planet for himself. After the end of the invasion, Gargoyle immediately resumed trying to destroy the Doom Patrol. However, the chief called on a favor from the United States president to fire a laser satellite at Gargoyle's ship, which completely obliterated him. Okay, so spoiler alert Gargoyle has basically had one of the. I'm, to me, it was one of the funniest side storylines within it mm -hmm. because on TV, what it is, the um, the Brotherhood of Evil hire him. He's basically an alien hitman. Mm -hmm. And so they hire him to take out the Doom Patrol, but they lie to him about the reason why. Mm -hmm. And so when he ends up actually coming against the Doom Patrol, he, basically he holds up in a motel room mm -hmm. for like weeks him him and his um cohort they hold up in a in a little dusty motel room waiting on their time they're waiting on information from the brain so that they can strike and when they find out he's uh he's lying or something he fools around and just be like you know i'm not going through with this <laughs> he just walks out of the story man. like it's <laughs> it's hilarious like they never have to deal with him he's just he just he's just cool about it. Like, you know what? I'll be back. <laughs> That's Peace. a good thing. Yeah. All right. All right. So next up, we have we do have the funniest. <laughs> now, maybe not funny in, in the comic books. He's quite he's horrific. He, he's quite comics. horrific. Yeah. But for TV, they made him the most hilarious character ever on Doom Patrol, and that is Animal Vegetable Mineral Man Sven Larson, whose first appearance was Doom Patrol number eighty nine. August of 64. Now, Dr. Sven Larsen became a victim of one of his own experiments when he was transformed into a being capable of taking on any animal, vegetable, or mineral form. He became animal, vegetable, mineral man. After a battle with the Doom Patrol, however, the chief deduced that Larsen's transformation was deliberate and that by killing the Doom Patrol, he sought revenge on the chief, whom he wrongly believed once stole an invention of his. Ironically, the device in question proved to be the sole means of stopping the animal, vegetable, mineral man by freezing him in a single transmuted form until he could be captured and returned to normal. Over the years, he teamed up with some of Doom Patrol's enemies, such as General Immortus and Mr. Somebody, who was actually Mr. Nobody mm -hmm. after a while. Um, after Flashpoint, it is noted that Larson wasn't proud, wasn't around to know as he suffered one last defeat by Robot Man. Now, if you see the picture, what it is, he went to this um, this doctor, and it wasn't generally Mortis. And in the TV show, it's not by his own hand. He basically goes somewhere trying to get superpowers, and this is a storyline that happens on the side of them introducing the Doom Patrol. And so 
something goes wrong, similar to like what happened to Deadpool, something go except Deadpool in his storyline, remember it was get back. Somebody was uh, tampering with the process. Mm -hmm. Well, in here, it was just a flawed process. Mm -hmm. And when he woke up, he was like he was, and he basically argued his main thing. His, he can never win a battle because his T-Rex head and his human head always argue with each other. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's animal, vegetable, mineral man. All right. And on to some other media where we've seen Doom Patrol. Uh, of course, we, we've been mentioning it throughout this entire presentation, uh, Doom Patrol that is on HBO Max, this live but action version of Doom Patrol can be found on HBO Max streaming service. And this team is similar to the one in comics with several character changes, as we've talked about throughout this. And most notably that Beast Boy only appears for a couple of episodes in the first season. And he's already a member of the live action Teen Titans show called Titans on HBO Max. So he's already left Doom Patrol to become a member of Titan. And his absence is filled by a younger version of Vic Stone, who is Cyborg. So that's who we got there. It's and like, before you change the picture, if you notice this season, well, at the end of last season and the beginning of this season, that thing that they're sitting on, that is a uh, mut a mutant butt. Awesome. No, no, they have to fight mutant. Matter of fact, at the end of season two, they zombified. <laughs> okay. And this is why I have to watch the show. Right. So now... <laughs> This last one is uh, Doom Patrol actually shows up on Teen Titans Go, uh, the cartoon. Now, this version of the Doom Patrol appears in the Teen Titans Go series. It's the group that Beast Boy originally came from before joining the Titans. In this version of the Doom Patrol, Elastigirl is an African-American rather than Caucasian, and Mento and Negative Man are replaced by the Chief and Negative Girl, respectively. Because if you remember in the beginning, Chief was not an actual member of the Doom Patrol. Mm -hmm. He just put them together. Yeah, he was, he was an invisible. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I must say that um, both of these versions of the Doom Patrol are are worth worth, it, worth the watch. Oh, yeah. I've seen the one on Teen Titans Go. Right. Hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. But the TV show is really worth the watching. If you like weird um superhero comics that kind of defy the norm of what's normal mm -hmm. because they're going to do that almost at every turn especially because they're dealing with um alternate realities and remember crazy jane who is a big part of the tv show mm -hmm. is dealing with her um trying to figure out why her personalities aren't working together and it's over 50 of them yeah she's got a lot going on yeah Right. And if you want to do your own research and look at some of the stuff, like I said, we only touched the surface, you can check out some of the stuff that we researched and dig a little deeper. There's a lot of information out there about this team, even though it is one of the uh, teams that have been put together, canceled, put together, canceled. Uh, they're still around in D.C. Well, they have a real big cult following. Yeah. And I think that's the reason. That's how they made it to the big screen. Yeah. They do have a little bit of color. Um, and if you want to check them out digitally, you can check out Comics Plus and borrow it with your library card. There's no holes, no wait. And you can get offline access on your tablet, computer, or smartphone. Just sign up today with your library card at the website below. And in two weeks, you will see us again, or at least hear us again, as we will be in, the, in honor and in preparation for uh, the Ant Man and Wasp movie, what's it called? Oh, Quantum Mania. Con Quantum Mania. We'll be covering Marvel's Ant Man and Wasp. Uh, this Ant Man and Wasp is a little bit different than Marvel's version. I mean, Janet and, and uh, what's his name? What's his name? Hank, Hank, Hank. Yeah. Well, that's the old man. Yeah, they're they're old in the movie now, yeah. but uh, we'll be covering their whole storyline and comic series. So we look forward to seeing you January thirty first at seven o'clock. We will see you then.